back again with another solo Q&A with the questions from Instagram and my email list. I think I've got about 33 to get through. I actually had some more than that, but uh, I think we'll try and keep this within the within the realms of a, about 60 odd minutes, hopefully. Question one, if you had the guarantee that no one would judge you or make fun of you, what would you do? I think we would all take more chances and accept greater chance of rejection if there was no chance that we were to be judged for the choices that we made. For me, starting an Instagram page with my brother in 2017, that was a risk. Starting the podcast, that opened me up to judgment as well. I've I've been made fun of. I was in the group chats uh, of like friends and kind of associates uh, around that time when they were saying, "What on earth are you doing? Taking your top off? Like, what are you what are you trying to gain from this?" And that hurts a little bit. Like you you do feel the the the, the judgment that comes your way. Equally, I left the insurance industry in a job at the biggest and best broker in that space to the much less reputable industry of of furniture. But as we'll touch on as the podcast goes, that's been a good decision too. So when you lean into choices that maybe people might judge, but you disregard what they think to some extent, well, of course, taking on board relatively like positive criticism, I think that's I think that's very, 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 very valuable. And broadly speaking, I don't think there's things that I'm holding back on for fear of judgment. I think I'm mostly taking action in the areas I think I should be. Um maybe something would be like speaking on a particular certain subjects that I'm um, that I know are controversial but in the future I'm going to try and do that as my skill in articulating myself and those broader concepts improves too I can take more of those risks as well uh, question two what characteristics do others appreciate about you most and what do you like about yourself I think there's going to be some overlap here hopefully but I think my reliability my calmness under pressure my ability to listen and be present with somebody when I'm having a conversation, when they share something with me, when they're talking to me. I think those are characteristics that people that I spend time with generally would like about me. In terms of things that I like about myself, I like those characteristics that I've named, but I also like my competence in tasks that I focus on. So the areas that I focus are fitness, mindset, public speaking, presenting, and sales. The characteristics that I employ and apply in those areas and those domains that I spend my most time. The fact that I'm competent in those, I like that about myself. And the overall ability that I have to showcase my skills in those areas, that's something that I like and I value about myself. Question three, what is being neglected in your life right now? How could you implement more of that? Three belters to start off with. Uh, I I touched on this in a later question that I actually had to prepare for because it was quite a big one. But I probably have neglected romantic elements of my life. I haven't dated somebody seriously since probably April 2021, so well over a year. I've made some effort and I've dated a few girls recently, a handful of times, but I've not really built a deep connection or seen anyone as a viable, like serious partner in a very long time. I think that is an element of neglect because that's a huge part of like the meaning of life really isn't it? to have companionship and like uh somebody that really matters to you that's not just like your your flesh and your blood i could definitely implement going to more places and events where i might meet someone who has the same interests and values that i have i think that's probably a really good way to make people equal like introductions from friends as i close in on 30 maybe by the time that you listen to this podcast i might have even turned 30 on the 10th of october but that seems to be quite a common way that people my age are introduced to like-minded people. It's definitely something I hope to work on, but I have found Glasgow a difficult place to achieve that just based on like kind of how the city is culturally and the, the kind of people that, that live here. But I take total responsibility for that because there are absolutely appropriate girls for me that would suit me in Glasgow. I just haven't taken ownership and met enough of them. I haven't... Um, worked on my own my, myself enough i haven't spent enough time in the right places and i haven't been intentional enough about uh, about dating question four this is a really really interesting question and it's quite long so sit with me i recently read in tyson fury's book about the use of alter egos and it really resonated with me it's about using an alter ego to cover gaps slash perceived deficiencies in your skill set for example tyson fury uses the gypsy king david bowie used ziggy stardust and Dwayne johnson used the rock albeit the latter was more character role based for wrestling my question have you ever used an alter ego and if so to cover what trait if not what would your alter ego be called and what traits would it excel in i love that question 
many of you will know that I use identity as a means of reinforcing the positive habits and behaviors that I want to have. So I'll tell myself that I am a, a strong willed, focused, determined person. So one of the identities I have is I am the guy who does what he said he will do. He wins big clients and work. He's reliable and supportive. He sets a positive example for others and helps them. I haven't necessarily built an alter ego in full though. I'm maybe more forthright and outspoken in certain environments, but I don't think I'm playing a character when I when I when I do that. So for example, when I jump on an interview with somebody, I don't think I'm call Cambro the podcast host. I'm calling Cambro, but maybe just a slightly more dialed up, better researched, more intense version. Yeah, so I, I think I think the version of myself that I play in everyday life just varies depending on the activity that I'm doing, but I don't think I'm necessarily using an alter ego in the same way that when Tyson Fury gets in the ring, he's the Gypsy King. <laughs> yeah, it's an incredible question to think about. I have, when I, when I really went into this, I think that going on like a stage or an arena or a pitch to compete against somebody else or even just like put forward your best self I think you can lean into a different persona and there's benefits to do that. So perhaps if I was doing a live presentation or a workshop, I would maybe try and tap into some sort of stage presence who had even more energy and was just a bit more extreme in other regards. And I'm not sure what he'd be called. Maybe it would be called Cambro rather than Colin Campbell. Who knows? Question five, how are the potential book plans going and do you have a timeline for completion and release? It's been a huge undertaking, but we are almost there. I expect to have it ready for just after the release of the 150th episode, which will be 17th of October, I think, all going well. If you're not on the email list already, please make sure you've joined uh, via the link in the show notes or the link in my Instagram bio. I have distilled down so much information for this book, so many insights, so many lessons from the first 150 episodes. It's absolutely packed with value and I cannot wait to share it all with you. Uh, question six, what do you attribute your resilience towards in work and your personal life? The lessons from building my body have definitely helped and they're probably fundamental. Seeing success in that one domain and applying it to other areas is something that's always helpful because you almost trick your brain into thinking that if I can do it in this area, then I can do it in any other. So I think gaining muscle and losing fat, it definitely teaches you to be resilient to stress at regular intervals. So that could be pushing through horrible sets in the leg press, dragging yourself to the gym when you're tired and you don't want to, sticking to your calories when you'd much rather have that extra bowl of cereal or a couple of cookies or you'd much rather have a few more drinks in the weekend rather than take the car. You create pathways in your head and your brain that you must sit with some discomfort and it's part of the process to get where you want to go. So I think you build resilience through learning these lessons in albeit a little bit of a, uh, how would I, a sanitized environment of improving your body it's not life and death um i certainly found that this helped me when it came to a period when i actually did come under a decent amount of pressure externally when the company that i moved to in may 2019 was sold and the entire company was made redundant many of you will listen to episode 15 when i spoke more about this but during that period i definitely stood up well to that challenge and i thought immediately around how can i deal with this how can i take action how do i move forward how can i put myself in the best possible position to take action. And that for me is resilience, dealing with the cards you've been dealt and trying to make the best of it. Beyond that, I haven't massively been tested strenuously from the outside world, apart from probably the lockdowns, which put pressure on all of us. And I dealt pretty well with that. I was quite skeptical about some of the measures. I, I pushed back a little bit, but I still dealt with the mental pressure of like not being able to live your, your normal life quite well. But I think my resilience mostly comes from a tried and tested arena of building my body and then applying that in in a work setting um, when it's been needed. Number seven, how do you navigate rejection, combating the inevitable highs and lows of sales and running a business? That definitely links to resilience, but I think the first thing is to never let yourself get carried away. Uh, interestingly, when I spoke to Simon Rhee on the podcast, he's a trader. He has a no high fives rule. I think that should be the case sometimes in sales. Like say you close this massive deal and the contract comes in, you're all excited. Don't get too carried away because there'll always be another curveball. There's always going to be a rejection. You need to celebrate the wins, but not get uh, too carried away. Equally, I think when you think about sales or business or anything, highs and lows are part of the process. You're not going to win every client you go after. It's natural to get rejected. You need to take that experience in 
make it a lesson. So like when a, a potential prospect says no to me, and that's happened so many times, even like last week, like we, we a new campaign, I'll maybe speak a, a bit more about this later in the podcast and answer to another question. But like out of the hundreds of people we reached out to, most of them said no. Only some of them said yes. And those ones that said yes, like that's great. Like just run with that. Like take take the take the highs, but accept that the lows are part of the process. And you're not going to convert every customer far far from it. You're probably going to only convert a, a very, very small percentage. But always take lesson from the rejection. So could I have improved my approach and how I handled myself? Could I have I've written a better email? Could my message have been cleaning? clearer could my presenting have been more compelling could i have mobilized my internal team at my company to present and create a better more compelling offer that they simply couldn't refuse or did i over or under negotiate there's so much that you can take from each bad situation that you can apply so that you have more good situations moving forward and there's always opportunities to learn also understanding that not everyone will like you and want what you have to offer you're often filtering for the next yes by getting the no and rejection really strings but that reminds me of what john viola said in the podcast the football agent he he's he's had like a 28 year career in the space he's really well known but he definitely thinks that when he phones up a club and he's trying to move on a player or he's trying to work for them to to move players for, for them every note that he hears is is closer to another yes from somebody else or another club or another player and I think the worst thing you can do in a sales career or any form of business is fearing no and never ask. It's better not to die wondering. Question eight, congratulations, call. What impact will your promotion have on your time you can allocate to the podcast and your social media profiles? First of all, thank you. Uh, to give a bit of a, a, an overview for those that uh, haven't seen on either LinkedIn or Instagram, I was pro promoted to account director for the North region for my company as of the 1st of October. So that was really, really good news. But in terms of impact on my time that I can allocate to like the side projects, like the podcast and social media, I would expect none because I've pretty much taken on the same role with similar responsibilities. And I don't expect it to impinge on my lifestyle outside of work. I was already doing quite a senior uh, role in terms of demands on me. And I was almost um, proving myself before I actually got the title and the, the responsibility and the package that came with that. So I don't expect it's going to be any greater impingement outside of my working hours that I already do. Uh, I, th I think a lot of people stress about working more when they could focus on being more productive in the hours that are allotted to them already. Importantly, I'm at a stage now with my life where I don't think I would accept a role that significantly shifted or changed the dynamic between my corporate job and the projects that I work on. It's clear in my values and my actions that I care about what I do on the side and working from home, like I'd probably say 90% of my, my time is spent working at home. It allows me to make the most of the time around my working day and even during my lunch hour to work on my projects. And when I am traveling to clients across the UK, I'm using the train 99% of the time as well. And I very rarely drive unless it's like Edinburgh or, or, or somewhere in Scotland. And that definitely helps too massively. So if I was to move company or take on a role, I, that would have to meet those requirements as well to now enable me to do the things that I love to do on the on the side and perform my best during my corporate job as well. Uh, number nine, uh, promotion related as well. What responsibilities and perks come with the new promotion? Uh, as I said, largely I was doing more senior duties and responsibilities before it became formalized. This is often the way in the corporate world and you can debate the rights and wrongs of this. You have to prove yourself. And if you think that's incorrect, it just allows you to reassure both yourself and the company of your capabilities. And you take on a little bit more before it's it's, it's, it's all put in writing and you, and you get that, that title in your email signature. Uh, responsibilities wise, I will have a little bit more input on the strategy, um, although myself and my colleague Dan, we were brought into this unit of the business to basically shape how it was going to grow and and, and move forward. And we've been doing that for 18 months now, so uh, uh, there's not a huge change there. But uh, the, the main change will be alongside my student accommodation sector customers, I'll be doing some work in the BTR space, which is the build to rent space in the north of the UK. Anyone with a passing interest in property in the UK, you should be aware of what's coming uh, because there's going to be a huge number of BTR beds and units uh, in the market. In Scotland alone, there's 13,000 units being built. That pales in significance to like Manchester, Leeds 
but it's it's going it's going to significantly change the accommodation landscape up here. Um, in terms of perks, uh, increased salary, uh, improved commission pot for hitting my monthly and my quarterly targets, and basically just uh, a better financial package. Question ten: Where do you sit currently with appetite for a romantic relationship? You're doing well within your career, so how would you and do you go about evaluating whether a new potential relationship is suitable to achieve your personal goals? For example, would they have to have similar interests, or would you want somebody who could enlighten you on an area? I think because I spoke, uh, maybe question three, I think it was, about what I was neglecting, I was quite glad to see this this question as well. And when I mentioned in question three that I neglected this area, even before I had two semi-serious relationships during my lifetime that I've had, I was pretty uncommitted to anyone in a serious way until I was 26. So I really took my time and I actually think this was healthy because it allowed me to like make myself into the kind of person I would want to be in the dating market. And Jordan Peterson's got a great phrase around this, and I'll touch a little bit more on Jordan later on because that's one of the questions. But he's often asked, how do you find my ideal partner? And he suggests instead of like asking that question, why don't you become more like the partner that your ideal partner would want? For me, that means living the values and behaviors I would expect of my partner have the relative status and means that I would demand and even look the way that I would expect my ideal partner to be attracted to as well. And you can say that's shallow, but for me, if you aren't in the aesthetic um, look or the mindset or the behaviors or the financial position that you would expect to attract the level of person you want to be with, then you don't really have a right to be annoyed. And importantly, the person that's asked the question uh, mentioned doing well in my career. I don't think a romantic relationship should detract from that or they're clearly not the right person for you or the right person for me anyway. I I don't think I would sacrifice what I do between 9 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. because of dating somebody. I I just think that would be that that you would have to like significantly damage the rest of my lifestyle for me to be performing poor in work. And I think in the like the only thing I'll acknowledge is that in the courting stage when you first meet somebody, you might spend a bit more time frivolously because you you're taking the time to assess them more, you're investing in someone without being able to guarantee that you both have what each other wants and needs. But ultimately nothing ventures, nothing gained. And like we do all have time and we need to invest accordingly. And I'm absolutely open to meeting the right person, but that's just not happened. And that in- she indicates it's probably more work for me to do to improve who I am to meet the standard of woman I have an interest in, 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 in being with in the longer term. So like that Jordan Peterson quote speaks very much to me. Like maybe I shouldn't moan about like the quality of women I've, da- I've dated recently and instead should be like, right, Colin, what else can you do to improve yourself so that you are more attractive and suitable for the right kind of woman that you expect yourself to get with? Um, Alongside that, vetting a potential partner is absolutely vital. So you were asking about like, um, how would you evaluate? If it's not right, you cut it off quickly. Like two dates is like a big drop off for me. I think the first date people are nervous, including myself sometimes, and it's not always a fair assessment. So interest wise, like I would be trying to assess, uh, are we fairly aligned? But with some variety, of course, like you're unlikely to find a carbon copy. I wouldn't want somebody who has a, like zero interest or uh, like no support for the things that I care about? Do they need to be as into fitness as I am? Absolutely not. But a passing interest in looking after their mind and their body, 100%, like that's that's pretty much a given. Do they need to like things like golf and football? Absolutely not. But they can't hate it or hate the fact that I spend time invested in those particular sports. Like that would be a problem. Um, do we clash on like other things as well? So like values is a huge piece too, isn't it? Are they family orientated? What's their moral compass like? How do they act in private and public with service staff, with their family, with their friends? Do they have ambition? Like how supportive are they when it comes to your goals? Can you both push each other in a positive way? Or are they, as you were maybe alluding to, like detracting from your career? Are they uncomfortable with the fact that you're, you you want to grow and improve yourself? So I think like those are like all things I would vet. And I think when I've spent time working on myself, I want to meet somebody that uh, works on themselves or is in a position where they're already in a, re- in a really, really good spot. Question 11, a little bit lighter than that topic. Favorite item of clothing you own and why? I like my white Ralph Lauren shirt. It's actually the one I'm wearing in the display photo for the podcast and the logo. 
I always liked Ralph Warren growing up, but I guess you kind of just like have an affinity with that brand because it's like it innovates somebody like who's quite cool. And I didn't have lots of it really because while my mum and dad like really looked after us and, and we didn't really want for anything and I was well turned out, I didn't have like Ralph Warren because that was like super expensive, particularly like when I was growing up, it seemed like it was a, like a much more expensive brand. So being able now to buy it myself and I've got quite a lot of Ralph Warren shirts, a lot of people joke about that. I it feels nice to have that and this is a white one so I I, I quite often go for like a, like if those that are watching on YouTube will see that I'm wearing like a white polo shirt I quite like wearing like crisp white colors um on my on my top half anyway I haven't really got white chinos but maybe that's a look for for summer 2023 so yeah my favorite item clothing Ralph Warren white shirt uh, question 11 a crypto one what's your favorite altcoins i like xrp because i see it as the bridge between traditional finance and the decentralized crypto world i don't think we're going to go overnight from uh, the traditional fiat system that we've got to a decentralized crypto world so there needs to be something in between and i very much look at the the future of, of the use case with xrp for the seamless transfer of money i think it's it's got a lot of value to that at the time of recording really recently actually ripple um xrp has had a positive result in their lawsuit with the sec as well and that's positive for the longer term and even the short term price of xrp has actually responded as well beyond that the probably the other altcoin i'm most exposed to is chsb and that's the native coin of swissborg which is the exchange i use to buy and hold most of my crypto as well so i love swissborg for the ease of use the transparency the sustainable but pretty positive yields that you can get on coins as well if you're holding it in there and i see swissborg being one of the biggest exchanges when it comes to people purchasing and holding crypto and with that will come a high value coin like binance has achieved for example it's been over a dollar before i think maybe one dollar thirty potentially it's all-time high and while it's down at maybe like 30 cents just now i'm confident it's going to go well beyond that again right quick drink of water and on to question 12. when asked to make a critical decision under pressure what do you do to navigate this I think I'm quite good at trusting my gut, but equally I do like to review the data and that links to the kind of personality stuff that I spoke about with Thomas Erickson and this personality test that I've done. But when you're under pressure, that typically accelerates the process that you need to go through to make a decision. And my personality type does lend itself towards speed as well as reviewing information. It's red, blue is the, is the color that links to that. So I do remain an action orientated person. And mainly I'd say that I make decisions based on what my immediate values tell me is the right course of action. I put them through a very quick filter in terms of like, is this in line with who I am and what I want to do? Yes or no, uh, action accordingly. So based on my career choices in sales, like I, like I, I keep myself busy, like the projects I undertake with the podcast, I actively seek pressure in those environments. So like, because I have so much on, I guess I like putting myself under pressure to make decisions quickly. And it seems to relatively serve me quite well. So whether that's like taking on like a big sales target or challenging negotiations with a customer or a deal or committing to like a, a weekly upload frequency on the podcast when I've got so much else going on and making sure that I'm doing like high quality episodes that are well presented, well measured, well researched. I'm asking my guests good questions. That's putting pressure on myself to perform at my absolute best. And I think decision making and clarity of choice when you are under pressure actually becomes easier the more that you do it. So look at it like reps in the gym like i always give this example like when you first squatted with a barbell on your back you probably were shaking like a shitting dog and unable to like coordinate but after a few months a year a couple of years of doing it, it it just feels second nature so you become better over time so i think the more that you put yourself under pressure to make decisions the the better you'll get in that environment question 13 best rave you've been to give us an answer for music only and a second for best show this might surprise some people, but I saw Above and Beyond at Amnesia when I went to Ibiza in 2017, and that was incredible. I wasn't drinking or partaking in anything else, and I think I had a can of Monster at like 10 p.m., and Above and Beyond were on at like 11, and it was just an incredible night. Uh, Amnesia and, I, and Ibiza were the way is an absolutely unbelievable venue, but a lot of the songs from Above and Beyond I'd listened to for years in the gym. Like I'd heard them on like Z's videos and was like just connected with them. And it felt amazing listening to those in person with a crowd that was in total flow. So that was probably the best rave that I've been to from that perspective. Visually as a show, I need to mention Eric Pritz, which I saw, uh, who I saw, sorry, at Warehouse Project in, yeah, just recently last month. And 
that was amazing, like the lasers, the lights, the intensity. But I actually would say that in terms of a show, Camel Fat was better because the atmosphere created was better. I think there is something about, and this will maybe like rile up some of the kind of classic techno heads or the real house enthusiasts here, but Camel Fat having like lyrics, I think the crowd just get far more into it and like they create like a more of an in sync uh, atmosphere. And while Pr- uh, Pritz's production and lights were probably amazing and they were better than Camel Fat, the crowd singing to breathe at the close of the set was genuinely something special. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. Question 14, favorite fitness brand and why? It's got to be my protein, doesn't it? Like, I've been a customer of theirs since like 2011. So there's an element of nostalgia there. Like, they offer so many different things, whether it's clothing, supplements, protein bars, like literally everything you need for your fitness journey, really, when it comes to like apparel and, and, and supplements, is covered by my protein and they have a high quality as well. I obviously have my ongoing relationship from a like an affiliate perspective, and I'm a sponsored athlete with them, and that's been going since like January 2019, so coming up for four years. And yeah, it, it, it's it, it's got to be them uh, equally. Like they're extremely affordable, and they're quite general in their outlook, so you you can get whatever you need from them at a reasonable price. Um, and of course, like me having a discount code and being able to give that to people is something that I'm like very proud and pleased about as well. Question 15: What areas of your nutrition and fitness do you want to develop most in the next 12 months? I'm largely content. Now, that is a horrible phrase I don't often use, but I'm actually quite happy to just train five days a week, pretty hard in the sessions that I go for, maintain a good physique, and ensure that I'm moving well and feeling good. Now, keeping stimulated is something that's important, and while I've got a very high threshold for boredom and I'm able to do the same things quite a lot and not really lose focus, I suspect to like gain strength and like feel like really interested. I might do like a moderate surplus between maybe like December till May. I'll probably try and hold like roughly where I'm at just now till about December. And then maybe I do like a gaining phase between December and May and just try and get a bit stronger and then do a do a tidy up for summer. We'll see. I've I've got no immediate plans in this space. I'm just quite happy for training to play like a good role in my life from like a looking good perspective, but feeling good perspective as well. Question 16, right? Grab your tea for this one. What's your thoughts on everyone taking gear these days? I think for starters, steroid use is far higher than the general population assumes. And while I don't think everyone's using it, and I don't even think like the majority of people that we see is use, are using it, I've trained with guys who are enhanced, and some I was surprised that they were just based on how they looked and how they performed. But then others that I've trained with who are enhanced, I've been blown away by the difference it's made for them. Like they are so much stronger, they are so much denser, like they are in unbelievable shape. I. I don't think people need to explicitly disclose that they are using, but they absolutely should not be claiming natty or even just purely preaching and focusing about things like hard work and dedication, nutrition, recovery, because things are an awful lot easier when you've got a much higher, like supernatural levels of testosterone. It just it just neglects the bigger picture if you're missing out that part of the the, the equation. I yeah. I, I would say to anyone who I've been like truly impressed by that uses steroids they have been nailing so much else that's going on like they're super diligent they like track their blood work they track the nutrition they track their sleep they do everything that's like on the money and they're really doing the work but i think one of the biggest issues that people are maybe neglecting and maybe this question is hinting towards is that i actually think a lot of professional athletes are using steroids as well and while they're not necessarily anabolic compounds like a testosterone or a um, I don't know, some oral ones like Anavar or uh, uh, D-Ball. They're using stuff that's improving their performance, but not necessarily muscle mass. And it's almost setting unrealistic expectations of what's possible when it comes to human performance. And I think there's a lot to be said for that um, in the professional sports arena. I think there's a lot of drug use going on that we're not privy to. And it would damage sports reputation if that ever came out but there's a lot of protection. Anyone that's not seen Icarus on Netflix, uh, that was an incredible documentary. And if the Russians are doing it, which albeit we can say are what we like about Russia, they are quite like, like, this kind of seem like the bad guys, don't they? But what they did in the doping space was probably being done by other nations as well, I would suspect. Question 17, what do you want most? What question? I think I want fulfillment from the activities that I undertake daily. And I want, I want to be doing things that feel meaningful and I have something to work towards that 
is like greater than myself and that the things that I'm doing are contributing to that goal and that needs to be like like a, a net positive for myself but also for others around me and equally I want myself to be in good physical and mental health and those I care about to to be the same so that that's what I want fulfillment purpose and good health for myself and for those that I care about Question number 18, right, this is the most jailbait question I think I was asked, but I've included it because I, I, I feel I have to. <laughs> is it more emasculating to be pegged in doggy or pegged in missionary? Right, before we start this question, I think any form of pegging is pretty much 10 out of 10 when it comes to the emasculating scale. Like, you can't really be pegged as a man and not be completely emasculated. However, if we're considering position-wise, I think doggy probably because you're physically being like bent over and like quite a submissive position like you're literally taking it from behind like people joke like oh like I'm really taking it from behind at work at the moment like that is like literally what's happening there although there's obviously an argument for missionary is worse because you are watching what's happening to you (laughs) I can't say I have a massively strong opinion out of the way on this one I, I I can just confirm that pegging for me I think is 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 just emasculating entirely in general Question 19, if you had to teach something, what would you teach? I think I would teach sales training for business to business sales or public speaking and presenting. One of the two. There's definitely an overlap and I feel these are skills that I have relative mastery and I've worked on and I've like learned how to get better at myself and through really good coaches. But I can also communicate the process I went through as well. So how I improved, the common mistakes that are made and the mistakes that I made, the immediate fixes that you can make, but also the longer term areas that you can develop and work on and zero in on like the sources that you can use to improve and i reckon i could run a pretty good workshop in terms of people improving on their on their sales or equally just their public speaking they're presenting question 20 favorite piece of tech and why uh it's the laptop that i'm recording this on the macbook air laptop that i've got i use it for all my side projects the podcast my email list writing this ebook that i'm working on uh, replying to emails everything even like managing my social accounts i use the laptop for a lot of dms it it syncs perfectly with my iphone Uh, that's the 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 beauty of um uh, iphone and apple um and touch wood it it's just it's just it's just very very valuable i I wonder if people would expect me to name some really random piece of tech for this answer like a blender for protein shakes or i don't know like some fitness tracker thing that i had that like gave me the all the amazing secret answers like some like sleep tool that i had but no for me it's just the modern day basic of a of a good laptop that that works really well and is compatible with my phone question 21 oh we're getting philosophical again what would 15 year old call say if you could tell him you had a chart topping podcast i think you'd be surprised i wasn't terribly confident at 15 and I don't think he would expect me to be exposing myself to the world on a daily basis. Now, obviously, the whole world does not listen to this podcast, but they could, in theory, couldn't they? So literally anyone could listen. I wouldn't know because unlike when somebody goes on your LinkedIn profile and it shows you who's listened, the podcast doesn't have that data other than maybe like what the, what demographic they come from in terms of age and location. When I was at school, like 15, I wasn't, I was maybe confident in some settings, like some classes that I was really passionate about. It's like modern studies. I was quite political, so I was quite switched on. I was outgoing. I was engaged. But many situations socially, I wasn't particularly robust, and I definitely wasn't the confident and assured man I am now speaking in this microphone in, in, in almost every environment I kind of put myself in nowadays. I have a level of like self-confidence myself. I can have a conversation. And maybe Cole would ask, at 15 like how did this happen and i have to explain that like the skills just were built over time and i eventually managed to apply them in the right domain and really try and double down on something that i cared about which is this podcast at 15 i, I was capable but i was under enthused i was lacking direction i think the same with many of us at 15 like you just weren't really aware of what your potential was and maybe focused on like other things or like too worried about what people would think to 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 like do things that you might actually care about Question 22, what's a topic you're scared to talk about? I don't know if I'm scared, but I think there's a struggle to articulate myself really clearly about what's going on with the gender conversation. Like gender and sex and all the hype and the animosity around that. I think it's been going on for quite a while now. And I do believe that we have past peak woke 
where people are starting to push back a little bit on some of the things that you just like see and you're just like, oh, that's absurd. Like that can't be the case. That's like not scientific or like there's no way that that can be the case. But there's still a lot of catering for like quite baffling ideologies that just have no basis in science or common sense or even like like even like the most compassionate caring persons like that doesn't make any sense. Like what you're doing is it just doesn't make sense. It just seems like wrong. And we seem to have encouraged like the like the extremes of the extremes to just make them feel comfortable when really that's a bit unusual and like should continue to be treated as such. So I guess maybe I'm scared of like put my foot in my mouth about those topics because I'm just I don't have like a well articulated enough view on that. Uh question twenty three. What is one thing your listeners should know about you they haven't told them already? Oh um so when I thought about this question, I think that I disclose quite a lot on the podcast, on Instagram. And I mean, even in this conversation, listen to back what, what I've said about relationships in this podcast. I've told you like quite a lot, really. I'm pretty open. Um, I've told you about my 15-year-old self there. But to go be, to go a little bit deeper, I think a lot have been like a lot of what has shaped me has been my quest for like self-development and improvement since about 2013. I think when I like got quite serious about my fitness journey and I was consuming a lot of like fitness YouTube, I felt like, I felt like that's like when I started to kick on and become like a more actualized, like positive version of myself. But long before that, there was definitely experiences that I reflect on that are hugely impactful. And chief among those was that I was bullied in my last year at primary school and it wasn't like physical bullying, like I wasn't beaten up, but I was verbally like picked on and like like just, just generally abused a little bit. And I certainly let that experience sit with me for an awfully long time. And it definitely impacted my confidence, it impacted my place and my understanding of my place in the schoolyard hierarchy. And knowing what I know about myself now, like my capabilities and even the capabilities of the boys that picked on me, I'd have put it behind me a lot sooner, but at the time, I went in, like, left primary school and went into secondary school, not particularly confident about who I was and who I am, and like able to hold myself quite strongly. And on reflection, like, obviously, I'm talking about like my capabilities now. Like, I'm quite reassured about what 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 I'm able to do. And like, if I could tell my whatever age I was, like, eleven year old self, that that would be very helpful. But I also truly believe that you need to actually stand up for yourself physically. I don't think necessarily I would have won if I stood up to those bullies, but going for somebody with intent and a little bit of aggression and just showing that you will not stand for being treated the way that like you're being treated is primal and it's built into us. And on reflection, like escalating the situation by just like like saying fuck you and just like th- th- throwing a few wild haymakers at eleven years old, that escalates the situation in the short term and people might be oh that's not not like the right thing to do to be violent to turn to violence. But at the end of the day, like when you're like eleven years old and like full of like hormones and you're about to go through puberty you should just react like with like fury rather than try to put the better man and like go through the school system and the teachers like they're not going to be able to really help with like the laws of the playground so I, I i do regret not escalating physically and i reflect on how i was quite a shy child in quite a lot of domains until like my last year of secondary school really and the fact that i had a bit of a tough time at primary school definitely led to that so until like i was in sixth year school like um what six years later after that and i'd built some status from lifting weights and getting a bit jacked i got an unconditional to glasgow uni to show that i was quite clever these things elevated my status and they they reassured me of my value both myself but also to others around me but up until that point like and i was saying about 15 year old me in the question before i felt quite lost like i wasn't exploring my full capabilities until later life and I think when I look back on events like that, I think that shapes you in some respect because I feel like when you lose time and you don't explore your potential and what you might become until, I don't know, like let's say 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, whatever age I I think I started to really do that, that's disappointing and like that, that feels like you left some opportunities in the table and I just quite simply won't let that happen now and I think that experience and the way I've now been able to frame that in my head is definitely important and maybe some people assume that my drive comes purely from discipline direction and self-development but sometimes it comes from just being like i'm not gonna let that happen to me again like i'm not gonna let how other people have treated me poorly affect what happens now and i actually 
actively enjoy using the fuel of like disliking people from my past who who I feel have wronged me to get into a better place. Like I got into better uni than both those guys and was like, get it fucking up you. I got a better graduate job than them. That felt great. I trained a bit harder and got in better shape than them. That felt good as well. Like spite can be a good driver, but I also want to make sure, and the more important lesson rather than just getting up to people I didn't like is just making sure that you're not wasting time caring about what others say and like how they've treated you in the past. Like just move forward and be the best version of yourself for you. But of course you can use a little bit of fuel to, to push you along the way a little bit fired up there in a few f-bombs but uh that comes from the heart question 24 the last time you felt a flow state a flow state is just that simple like time passes effortlessly you're just like moving through an activity or a, a situation it was probably last friday i was prospecting for a particular new section of the education market that we're going after in work uh, i mentioned earlier we're like I got quite a lot of rejection, but it was it didn't really matter. Like we were actually went after hundreds of different new clients. And I was typing emails, I was creating outbound messages, I was refining how we were gonna do it, I was booking meetings, I was handling objections, I was progressing opportunities and doing some quotes. It just felt great. And I, I honestly I looked up and I must have started like one o'clock or whatever. And it was like it was like half four, quarter to five. And I was like, it just it gone like in the blink of an eye. So that was a total flow state for me. Question 25, are you creative and what's your definition of it? Can it be learned? I'm going to go with one of the official dictionary definitions for creativity. So creativity is relating to or involving the use of the imagination or original ideas to create something. I don't think I'm naturally creative in many areas, but I do see myself as somebody who can see something and refine it and be inspired by it. So like building on the foundations and improving on it. We all stand on the shoulders of giants and those that came before us who like, created the way forward. I think there's very little original in the world that's not been done before. So quite often when you see someone de- do something, it's because they've somebody before them has done it and they've decided to take on the mantle and do it better or do it in a different way. And I'm clearly like a relentless creator and a producer, but am I creative? I don't know if that makes me creative or super imaginative or unique. I like to think that what I produce has a different take or style or edge to it than what maybe another podcaster creator would do and i certainly hate the idea that i'm like a generic cookie cutter host or somebody that just does the exact same as everything else that's happening out there but i don't necessarily think that i am doing something that's revolutionary and new from a creative perspective importantly in terms of learning to be creative yeah i think you can learn to create more and i think you can learn to be like somebody that puts things out there but i don't know if you can learn to be original maybe maybe not anyway uh, one one interesting thread that came to mind when i thought about this was creativity links a lot with imagination as per that dictionary definition and i definitely improve my imagination through reading fiction and even like so i recently read the midnight library and my brain was firing off a lot more i was actually found myself being better to write my own ebook after reading fiction although what i'm writing my ebook has absolutely nothing to do with fiction whatsoever but my mind was firing better after reading that and even like just reading in general has helped me with writing my book because you see how other authors position things you think about these things so that doesn't make me creative but it makes my imagination fire up and i take inspiration from other podcasts and other content i consume online so i guess i'm learning to look to others for inspiration to then create off the back of that so i don't think i'm naturally the most creative or unique creator but um i think you can learn elements of creativity question 26 thoughts on z's so z's was uh, uh an australian i think he was based in australia anyway uh, like kind of bodybuilder party guy who was i would say the first fitness influencer we're talking like 20 10 to 2012 he just blew up on youtube and facebook and he actually inspired the men's physique movement because before that competitions were all just the big kind of bodybuilder guys like your arnold schwarzeneggers and then things in that space kind of went too far with like phil heath and the people with like kind of big like that kind of big bubble roid gut look so z's pulled things back from there to like a more what i would call aesthetic movement so he was like the aesthetics revolution it was called and I think he had a net positive effect. He brought a lot of energy and passion to the space. He encouraged people to take control of their life and move forward. And just uh, 
like he had quite a euphoric, happy attitude towards lifting in life. He was like dancing about. Now, yes, he was definitely using steroids. Yes, he was using recreational drugs. And yes, he died at a young age. But you don't have to go the whole hog when you consume some of these content. You don't have to mimic all their uh, characteristics and traits. And his tragic passing at a very young age is a, is a lesson to people to be careful what they put in their body. But his message that you could be, and I think his term was a, a, a sick cunt, through lifting weights and through taking control of your life is actually a positive overall. So yeah, thoughts on these like fair play to him, like absolutely uh, very, very inspiring question 27. Do you think having a good body composition is actually more attractive to females? We're getting quite a lot of dating questions today. Uh, yes. Having more muscle mass, uh, statistically improves your chances in the dating market. It's, it's, it's inarguable. It's evolutionarily advantageous to be in shape because it infers competence and your ability to support and be a provider. Now, regardless if a female needs or requires the support in the modern world, you can all argue that, but our genetics actually encourage females to seek out partners who actually have the capability to support, even if they don't necessarily need that partner to support. So muscle and good body composition is just one form of that. Another form of that is finance and security as well. That's just, that's an element of status too. And it elevates you to a level where you become more desirable to females. Now, people can shout into the abyss and shake their head and disagree. And you can argue with yourselves all the rights and wrongs of evolutionary psychology. But when I spoke to people like Adam Lane Smith, genetic programming is still there, even tens of thousands of years on from us cutting around as, the, uh, as, as, as hunter-gatherers. And having a level of lean muscle mass is an advantage from that perspective. But I also think you need to note that good body composition is also subjective and the physique that someone like I would consider to be really good is probably at the extreme end of what a female in the general population might view as good body composition as well. So there is a sliding scale and there's a lot of nuance there. Being relatively lean and muscular, attractive, definitely inarguable it looks better anyone saying they like a dad but better is lying to themselves because they're maybe uncomfortable how they look themselves in my opinion but it does start to have diminishing returns if you're striving for like minute small changes and improvements to a physique that's already deemed quite good so no girl has ever said oh that extra striation in your dial or those thicker triceps or that slightly bigger quad sweep that you've got this year that's what really drew me in to like go on that date with you they were just like oh he like he like like trains hard and looks good like that's that's attractive question 28 have you ever considered going enhanced not seriously i did look into what a reasonable protocol would be for me and how it would work what i would what i would take what would be the expected returns like how i would maybe come off it and that was like maybe like late 2018 when i was like still like quite seriously pushing with like purely just bodybuilding style training and kind of spinning my wheels and wondering if i was at my natty limit I got a lot of good advice from a number of people and one piece really stands out to me. It was a guy I used to train with uh, sometimes at um, JD gym in, in Glasgow North. And he said to me, you won't just do one cycle. It doesn't work like that. You're going to feel superhuman when you're on it. You're going to be pushing PRs. You're going to be gaining more muscle than you've ever done before. You will come off, but then you'll return and you'll chase that feeling again, this time with more drugs, bigger side effects, bigger risks. That process will never end. So only ever start steroids or something as serious as that if you're committed to a lifetime of use and the management and the potential health risks off the back of that. And that for me was like straight away, I was like, well, I'm definitely not going to start taking them because <laughs> if I never can stop and I always have to be conscious of this, then that's something that I'm maybe not even willing to, 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 to undertake. I think when you see like particularly young guys like using like oral only cycles and I spoke to this with uh, with Thomas Moore TM cycles on the podcast back at like episode 50 something he was so like serious that young guys just jumping on steroids like maybe like buying some Anavar or whatever and, and just throwing it down their throats they don't understand what that means for the future for all sorts of different areas of their life and they might get away with it this time but what happens if they come off that cycle, they go to Ibiza, they feel good, they look great on holiday, they come back and then they just like cannot get the same progress in the gym. So they jump on again and then they take more this time. They take some more serious drugs, they take harder drugs. I think for me, you need to be very, very cognizant of the risks that you're taking on and the fact that like all things, we will adapt to the stimulus that we've got previously and we're going to have to go again, this time bigger and harder. 
Um, the only other thing I would say when it comes to getting enhanced, I absolutely will consider TRT when I'm older. If my natural test levels start to drop off, I will look at testosterone replacement therapy. I think there's a big, big chance in the future we will see TRT clinics or at least wellness clinics that administer TRT in a different way to you would get it if you were to describe it on the NHS because you've got low testosterone levels. I think for me, that's very, very likely to be something that older men in the UK will get access to because I think it's coming in America and quite often what happens over there, albeit some things don't make their way across. I think this will make its way across. Question 29. Right, you're exposing me here. How do you set goals? Months, quarters, years, and why? I've confessed this before many times. I am so much better at setting process-based goals than I am at setting out ba- outcome-based ones. I check in on myself on a daily basis with my calendar, my to-do list, and even my gratitude journal. And I do the same weekly. But I don't massively look at my output on a monthly basis, but I do zoom out on quarterly, like in terms of like, kind of like, how am I getting on like four months into a year? And I certainly like to think how I compare to previous milestones I've had at different points. And I can use things like metrics in the podcast or like how my physique's looking or how strong I am. But that's mostly just like personal life and projects where I'm much more process driven and I occasionally zoom out and say like, oh, how am I getting on that basis? But I don't necessarily set like massive goals. Like I actually don't have like a download target for the podcast. I just have a target of produce a weekly episode, either myself like this or with a high quality guest. I've well researched and I put it out there, make sure I produce two to three video clips from a video editor, put those onto social, drive that forward. Like I don't have like, oh, the podcast needs to have... 10,000 downloads a week by the November 2022. That's just not in my head right now. Maybe I would benefit from that um, because interestingly, I have much tighter goals, targets and deadlines and KPIs in my career because I can judge where I'm at all times in terms of like the fiscal targets that I've done, the number of calls that the team have made, the number of meetings that we've booked with new prospects. Like that's all done through like monday.com, which is like a, a, a CRM system. So maybe I would, maybe I'd welcome somebody helping me better set up my goals and my projects, and hopefully I'm aimed in the right direction when it comes to the actions and the processes that I do take. But if I miss a target that really matters, then maybe I'm not clearing it at the moment. So yeah, the, there's a lot for me to think of there. Right, we've got about four questions to go. So drink of water, and we'll fire right through. All right, okay. Traditional troll question from Dick Kelly at Crypto Glasgow. Question 30. What will collapse first, the Great British Pound or the Rangers? I certainly hope neither, but it seems like the pound is really in a bit of a mess and it's being run into the ground, but that's long been the case. I think anyone thinking that the pound's suffering is purely the result of the recent mini budget has not been paying any attention whatsoever. Even before the pandemic and the quantitative easing we saw there, the currency had already been massively devalued before that with quantitative easing. Um, before Trump, Obama had printed more money than any other US president in history combined. So that that is that is like significant. Now, I know that's talking about the dollar and the pound, but quite often, as I said, what the US does, the UK follows as well in terms of uh, particularly economically as well. So we've gone through mass quantitative easing. We've gone through reduced productivity in the labor force. We've got low to non-existent interest rates for such a long period of time. And we have a society that are drunk on cheap credit and shit like Klarna. Like the pound was doomed long before Liz Trust and a kind of pretty ill-fated initial budget. Um, But enough about the pound. As for Rangers, Rangers have been to the brink before and they fought back. Despite everyone trying to kick them while they're down there, the fans stayed. We got a new board in. They pushed forward. We still carried on. And and we and, and we won our fifty fifth title, so Deck will be delighted with that answer, and I'm pretty confident Rangers won't go back to the brink again. So, uh, my prediction for question thirty is neither will collapse, and uh, I think if anyone was to collapse, it will be the pound at some point in the future when we're maybe ready for for crypto to take over. Who knows? That day might come. Question thirty one, age fifty. What do you hope to have achieved? Family, finance, and career. It's cool to look forward because obviously we've spoken a bit about my childhood and my teenage self and 15 year old call so far so let's let, let's do that again i think if at age 50 i'd like a family uh, i'd like to have two kids uh both boys maybe i don't know i don't know how how well i'd be able to raise a girl um i'd want to be in a position where they can go to a good school 
they can be comfortable in the choices that they make and just try and excel in whatever career or area they choose to turn their hand to. I'd want to financially be in a position where I personally would have no requirement to work at any particular field or role or any attachment I needed to do something because I'd want to have just complete scope and freedom to apply myself wherever my interests, talents or values took me at that point. Like I wouldn't want to be like, oh God, you have to work there, Colin, because that earns you 120 grand a year, which pays for this. I'd want to be a case of like, well, I've got enough money stored away or I can generate revenue through other means that means that, oh, like if I suddenly wanted to uh, work as a consultant in this random area, because that was what interested me at that point in time, then I could do that. Um, so that would be true financial freedom for me at, at that age. And to do that, you probably would have to have assets that you own and have compounded to enable you to have that level of choice. Career-wise, I have no idea what I'll be doing, none whatsoever, but I suspect it'll be something that centers around speaking, presenting, listening, providing value, insights, solutions, selling something probably, whether that's a product or a service. I think that's what I'll be doing and, um, in terms of like side projects with that career. I'll hopefully be speaking into, into a microphone, interviewing people, asking great questions and whether that's podcasts or God knows what we'll have by in, in kind of 20 years time. It could be any, any, any medium at all. It could be a VR headset for all we know. Question 32. How well do you think your childhood and particularly teenage years shaped you in terms of who you are? We're getting so many questions about like young call at the moment. So that's really interesting. But uh, I suppose I've spoken there about late primary school and it probably had a knock on effect for a number of years after that in terms of my confidence. And I lifted weights for the first time at 15 years old through rugby and that helped a lot and I felt it changed the direction of who I felt I was at that point because I was I, 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 very, I was just living a very average ex existence and the value that weightlifting gave me in terms of feeling physically more secure in myself but also the resilience that it taught me from like a mindset perspective it that that was that was so so important and I wasn't like a popular outgoing teenager. I was like meandering along. I wasn't hugely happy. I wasn't that purposeful. I wasn't that clear in what I wanted to do. I didn't I would I didn't have like massive success either. Like I was reasonably academically clever, but I wasn't the cleverest in the school. I was okay at rugby, but I definitely wasn't the best in the team. I wasn't even in the top like five best players in my team. And when I got into weights, that definitely taught me to want more for myself. I felt I could be more fulfilled and more focused, but also I think you you get a clearer feedback loop from lifting weights than I had in any other area at all because I could see like, oh, when I go two days a week, when I oh, the next time I go next week, I'm actually going to be stronger on squats because I did them twice last week. Like that's that's helpful at that age and you can see that. So I got a really positive feedback from that loop from that. Um, even like when you're that age, maybe like 15, 16, like, you're, like in Scotland anyway, you were sitting your hires, maybe that's A-levels down south. And you get a feedback loop in terms of where you're at academically and whether you've done the work, you will get the results in the exams. So th that's definitely important. In terms of like childhood and teenage years overall, like beyond that, I feel my parents gave me a great upbringing. And while the modern world would maybe argue against how much they encouraged me down like the traditional path with education and grad jobs, the standards they set in terms of like their expectations on me working hard and being focused was absolutely vital for how I apply myself like my parents would have been very disappointed if I hadn't tried hard in my exams and like tried to maximize the most of whatever academic flair or talent that I had and beyond that my dad running his own consultancy business and seeing every day how hard he worked and even how hard he continues to work now into his 70s it certainly set a standard for me during my teens of what was expected of like me as a minimum in terms of how I should carry myself importantly as well I think I'll mention that my dad worked from home and that was long before it was a fashionable thing he had an office in the house and I think I saw that it was possible to work from home and be successful and you weren't somebody that just like sat all day and watched Jeremy Kyle or daytime, other daytime TV and worked on the sofa with your laptop and a cup of tea he was like in his office on the phone like working doing meetings all the time and that probably gave me like a blueprint for my first graduate job when I worked from home entirely. And then now when I, when I work from home as well, knowing that you actually have to do, do some work. Right. Two questions to go. And the last one is an absolute mammoth one. So let's get our teeth right into this one. Question 33. You can take any three people dead or alive to play golf. Who are you picking? Right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pick 
three people who are all alive, or at least they are at the time of recording. And the first one is Tiger Woods. His story, the complications, the challenges, and the the achievements he's had, they all make him like an extremely compelling person to spend time with. While of course witnessing what is potentially one of the best golfers of all time alongside Jack Nicholas. And you get to see that in the flesh and you get to watch him. Apparently he's quite serious as well. Like I I, I saw like people talking about the difference between him and Rory McElroy at a, a kind of a, a pro am tournament where like a celeb was paired with a with a pro and Tiger was talking about the seriousness of the conditions and what shot kind of shot to hit because of the way the wind's blowing. Whereas Rory was just like having like general crack as the Irish would say. Um so yeah, Tiger would be the first one. After the Netflix Last Dance documentary, my second person is going to be Michael Jordan because I know during that they talked about him being a keen golfer and another, as we say, fascinating individual. However, I do wonder how he and Tiger would get on because they're both what I think most people would admit are pretty tortured individuals with a lot of pain, but who are people that were able to direct it in the most driven, focused possible way to achieve complete greatness within their sport so i think that'd be very interesting to watch in a social setting while also like the semi-competitive environment of a four ball of golf as well now lastly i'm gonna have to lighten the mood and i'm going to go for ali mccoist i think he would bring some lightness and some humor to what is going to be <laughs> like quite a challenging match and i'm not sure how good his golf game is at all compared to woods for example or, or maybe even mine hopefully but I've seen him play at my golf club, Hilton Park, a few times, uh, probably around 2010. A former assistant manager who worked at Rangers at the same time as McCoy's, Kenny McDowell, was actually a member at Hilton, and he had Ali up as a guest a few times. But for me, like getting to talk to Ali across the course of four hours would be amazing. Like He was a player at Rangers that was genuine royalty. And while we don't necessarily want to talk about his managerial stint, he is an incredible storyteller as well. Anyone that like isn't even a football fan that saw him on like a question of sport or has listened to him on talk sport knows that he is just an incredibly nice, interesting guy. And a kind of like a, a sort of selfish reason is that he was also at Rangers between 1986 and 1991 when my actually I think Ali was there before that, 1983 to 1991 when my grandpa was still alive and involved at the club so i wonder if he could tell me some stories about my grandpa i think that would be a, a amazing co- topic of conversation on the golf course right question 34 and one that a lot of people were asking different variations of i've grouped it into one and that question is what were the biggest takeaways from seeing jordan peterson live i covered the chunk of this on my email list but my iphone notes are absolutely full so if what i've done is i've basically just opened them up on the laptop just now and i'm just going to go through a few different areas and, and and we'll see what resonates with you but i think if you were to give like an overall summary he said so many things that related to the one headline which is i just felt that my determination for my own personal development was reinforced and the idea that the things that we say do think they affect the world around us and the key to happiness, greatness, success, divinity, progression is paying attention to yourself and what you do and trying to be the absolute best version that you can be. So that, that would be like a headline in terms of like a too long did not read sentence. But one of the most compelling ideas that he came up with and he sort of opened on this was that the depth of a belief or the idea that you hold is important. So like a shallow belief, if somebody challenged it, you don't mind and it's it, like you, you're quite easy, you're willing to change your mind quite quickly on. But if a belief is something that you hold deeply and it's very, very strong and you hold it tightly within your being and within your mind, if somebody challenges that, it impacts everything that you think about, everything you say, everything you do. And he, he gave examples of, of this. And one of the examples he gave was around trust in a relationship. And this can be shaken to its very core if infidelity is found. So if, for example, you find that your partner's cheated on you, it not only damages the memories of the past and the time you spent with them before, it shatters the certainty of your present with them in terms of everything you believed about what was what was going to happen in that moment, but also disrupts our view and our hopes of the future as well. So a partner cheating doesn't just break the trust in that relationship, but it also damages every other aspect of life as well because if foundationally you believe this is the person for me, this is the person I'm going to spend my time with, this is the person that cares about me. If that's not true and that's not the case, and your faith was so heavily invested there and it was misplaced, what else in your life might not be true? 
what other areas might not be as they seem. So Jordan spoke about like the depth of a uh, belief and how important it is to like consider how deeply we hold certain things. And one belief that controversially for for some people that Jordan's focus on exposing more and more is actually the climate change narrative. And this was an extensive section of the 90 minute lecture, and I won't necessarily do it justice in a brief summary just now, but he has real fears that the world has blindly allowed this narrative around climate change to cause significant human suffering that will peak this winter coming without actually questioning some of the foundational accepted truths or like some of the inferred facts that we have about climate and energy. And he mocks the line following the science in kind of reference to the, the pandemic that we've had stuffed down our throats the last few years in terms of that, oh, we're following the science line. And he says that that is a phrase that we should all fear because it's actually a contradiction. Science itself is a continually evolving area and topic and new evidence and information is coming to light at all times and must always be considered stress tested and challenged and reviewed. And for him, climate, it's so strongly held that climate's in crisis and it's man-made and there's more we need to do. To challenge it is an affront to so many people and it shakes their very foundations of their belief system of what they've been told for very many years. However, Peterson asks you to do just that and to question whether some of the, what he deems self-inflicted human suffering caused by the climate change actions and rhetoric that we're seeing is worth it at all. And that is a very interesting thing for him to choose to challenge and certainly something that's worth considering. One of the other areas I'm going to share with you is that Peterson uses a lot of biblical stories to illustrate his points. And anyone that's read either 12 Rules for Life, um, Beyond Order or um, Beyond Chaos would be able to remember some of the stories that he told within that and he explains that biblical stories are not just a description of previous events in history or the things that may have occurred but they're actually a commentary and an observation of human nature itself as it occurred and while it continues to occur so he's using stories to demonstrate how we continue to live our lives as humans rather than actual people that maybe took part in these stories so he was saying atheists relate to things being real and these being physical things and of course will challenge the reality of the bible but peterson actually rubbishes this and his example is really really good it's, his example is pain and he says pain is of course real and that means that things don't need to be physical to be real like if somebody if somebody experiences pain how can you tell them that it's not real in the same way that how can you tell him that biblical stories that he talks about are not real and he uses these stories from the bible to understand how humans act now and i think that's a great skill that he's got and he does this repeatedly throughout the lecture but also throughout his books and one of the stories he brings up is cain and abel are discussed when it comes to the attributes of virtue and jealousy and he brought the story to life to illustrate fairness we cannot so for example we cannot seek justice and expect equity of return in all areas and that was what the argument between cain and abel came down to and life just doesn't work in terms of everyone getting a fair crack of the whip in terms of the exact same result from the exact same amount of work. So putting in hard work does not necessarily guarantee you the same result as another. Your toil may not merit the same as another, and you may not be guaranteed like the same level of benefit. And this is a fact that you must accept. I'm not someone who holds a religious faith, and I'm, I'm, I'll definitely admit that. Although some of the conversations I've had in the podcast over the period, I can see the benefits of having a religious faith. And equally, when Jordan uses the stories in the Bible to bring that to life, I get tremendous value now, and it gives me some perspectives that I didn't have before when I hear these biblical tales. After all, they are as old as humanity itself, and our programming doesn't necessarily differ too much from then, as I was saying, when it comes to evolutionary psychology. And... Yeah, it was it was it was it was incredible to to hear that. There was there was so much more to the lecture, and I'll share something that somebody listening that didn't get to see uh, the 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 show or maybe hasn't consumed a lot of Jordan's content before says, and I, I'm sure anyone that chooses to listen to our podcast at Mind Campbell Conversations will hopefully resonate with this. And and Jordan said, I don't tell people you're okay the way that you are. That's not the right story. The right story is you're way less than you could be. And for me, that just sums up the whole quest for personal development. You're you're okay the way you are. That's not a line that anybody should be told. Like you quite simply are not like the whole like you're enough gal and some girl throwing up peace signs telling you you're you're, you're fine the way they are when they spend 
hours a day training the gym or um, thousands of pounds on surgery. That's just not correct. So for me, I think I can throw my weight thoroughly behind the fact that you're way less than you could be and you could be more and you should be more. And there's an opportunity for you to do that. And sources like Jordan Peterson and hopefully this podcast can enable you to do that as well. So that's a wrap. 34 questions wrapped up in just over an hour and 10 minutes. Thank you as always for your support. Please, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the email list. So you're one of the first to hear about your chance to get your hands on my upcoming ebook. And of course, tune in for the 150th episode, a huge mile for the podcast. But once again, thank you for listening. And I'll be back to speak to you all again very very soon.